Good afternoon, my friends. I'm recording this video as an alternate to what I had done before because there were so many problems with the July 18th videos that uh, that I just really didn't have much of a choice. Um, the entire evening's worth of videos are going to be edited down to a more or less better um, summary of what happened during the game session. Hopefully only an hour at most. I will try and cut down that four and a half hours or whatever it is down to uh, down to one hour or less if I can. Uh, this is going to have to be very much like the original um, recap videos that we did for uh, Popes in Space and uh, um, uh, the other two adventures that we did. Now, originally, this night, July 18th of 2020, was the very first night that we recorded using OBS Studio. And, of course, I was just learning it at the time, so I didn't have my audio set the way it was supposed to be set. Thus, it gave me some, some real issues when I went to edit it. I also haven't figured out still how to separate tracks so that each of my players is speaking in a separate track. But now I figured out the sound issues. I know what to check each time before I go to to run the game. So what we're going to do is get into some instructions for the original adventure of the game, and then we will begin Possibility Blackout, which was the adventure I wrote and published on the Infiniverse Exchange in uh, late 2017. Uh, and it's a game that uh, is based off of the original Relics of Power, or not Relics of Power, the uh, Before the Dawn from the original 1990 box set for Torg role playing the Possibility Wars. I Again, this is only going to touch briefly on the things that happened during that night. I hope to describe everything that's going on and make it interesting for you to be able to see it. Thank you again for joining us. Uh, for this ongoing set of of, uh, of adventures, and here we go with the instructions for the game. Welcome to the new live video recording of uh, Torg Eternity for our group. Uh, I'm going to be running an adventure that I wrote based off of a an adventure from the original Torg role playing the Possibility Wars. I renamed it Possibility Blackout, and here's the introduction. Some important things have happened to Earth over the past three months. It all started with the appearance of the Maelstrom Bridges and the sweeping storms which changed our Earth's reality in many places. Death and destruction came with these storms, followed by the terrible Possibility Raiders, who have attacked our planet with untold power, speed, and ferocity, killing millions and enslaving countless others. The laws of nature the world over have become very strange indeed, and millions of people have transformed into beings better suited to realities unlike our own. North and South America have been invaded over vast swaths of land by lizardmen called Adenos and their dinosaur companions. The United Kingdom and Scandinavia have been overrun by races and creatures from ancient mythology, including Vikings and sorcerers, wielding impossible yet formidable magic. France has become a frighteningly high-technology theocracy. The Middle East has been taken over by a ray-gun-wielding lunatic with a penchant for restoring the glories of an ancient Egypt that was never our own. The entire region in and around India now crawls with creatures from horrific nightmares. Denizens of a suddenly high-tech pan-Pacific region have begun to kill and eat one another. What in most religions are termed miracles, while never commonplace, have become tangible in our own reality. What was tied only to stories from holy texts prior to the invasion are now truth across the world. When the bridges fell, you became a special type of person, changed to become something more, capable of moving through the zones of alternate realities with much less difficulty than ordinary people. As well, you are able to perform feats allowing you to fight the invaders in their own realities. From somewhere on Earth, the term Storm Knight has been coined as a title, and because you are one, uh, because you are one, you are treated differently in Core Earth than in, any, in other realities. You have found out Core Earth is not the only place knights originate from, but there are others from the realms within these realities willing to help you fight and, if possible, remove the raiders from this Earth. 
We have been engulfed in unprecedented madness for close to three months, and though it has united humanity in an unprecedented way, that, uh, that madness may prove to be our undoing, unless you act with haste and uh, strength to rid the earth of them. Adventure Background now, as the fourth month of the invasion opens, scientists have discovered possibility energy, which allowed you to become a storm knight. And they have also discovered that not only should there be a lot more of this energy, but it is also abating. As a result, some who accept the mantle of storm knight are losing their energy. The shock of this reversion is, in many cases, causing people like you to die. Proof comes in videos from around the world of storm knights lying on tables as they revert to ords, or ordinary people right before the alarmed eyes of the best scientists and medical experts the world has to offer. Act 1, Jungle for the Vine, Scene 1, Reconnoiter. You're in a standard zone. The Kentucky, or standard scene, in the Kentucky zone in a dominant living land area. You've been traveling frequently into the eastern living land over the past six weeks, running supplies and seeking clues to help the Delphi Council solve a big problem they've been having. You have not been briefed about what they are looking for. Today, however, as you are preparing to leave on your next run, you are called to a briefing. A tall, well-built older man in a military-cut khaki jacket with a New York Yankees baseball cap and a pair of darker aviator-style sunglasses, whom you already know as Quinn Sebastian, steps to the podium before you and begins explaining. <clears throat> One of the High Lords is stealing possibility energy from specific Storm Knights, and this is typically the outcome. He steps back from the podium, and a video plays on a large monitor at the front of the room. Three people, an Adinos, a woman with wires sticking out of various places in her upper body and legs, all connecting back into her body in other places, along with a right arm that appears to be metallic, with a piston attached, and a man who does not look special in the least, lie on three gurneys in what appears to be some manner of arboretum. Tall flowers with red and blue petals are seen behind them and between the gurneys. The man, in his late 20s and mid -30s, to mid-30s, suddenly begins to writhe in pain, some manner of energy crackling around his skin, deep blue smoke appearing in, from his ears, nostrils, and mouth. He convulses several times, orderlies rushing to help him as he falls from his table to the ground, dying on the video screen. A close-up of his face is seen in the video next, horribly wrinkled, dead eyes sunken into their sockets, skin and ashen blue, a withered husk. The older man next to the monitor knifes his hand across the front of his neck, signaling the projectionist to stop playback as he returns to the podium. This is what you're facing if we do not figure out the cause and actively work to stop it. The council believes there is some manner of machine at work here, perhaps using a call tech and weird science in concert. This is why you are here today being briefed. Now, what do we want you to do? About three weeks ago, one of our operatives in Cairo had an interesting talk with a drunk, weird scientist by the name of Marlin. He told our man he was preparing to test an incredible digging machine able to tunnel under the earth at great velocity into the living land to trade several crates of guns for an artifact, one of cause, wonders. He was unaware of the purpose of the artifact or why so much would be traded for so little, just that Dr. Mobius needs it for some reason. Knowing that is good enough for the Council to send you on an assignment to intercept Mobius Prize and, if possible, follow the clues to solve the reason this. He points to the monitor, paused on the younger man's now dead face for effect, is taking place. Stop it. We all hope you're up to the task. If you find anything that might indicate why our energy is being siphoned off or how to make it stop, if you have time, you will report them to me. If time does not permit, you will follow any leads to conclusion. My lieutenant will go over mission parameters with you now. The older man steps down while a, a DC intelligence operative takes his place near the podium and explains, you are tasked with intercepting the artifact and, if possible, boarding the digging device to return to the Nile Empire from where you may gather intelligence and perhaps continue the mission to conclusion. Over the next hour, you learn more that is related to the mission but not critical and can requisition anything you feel necessary to the success of the mission. Bearing in mind the war is being fought on many fronts and you have physical limitations. It is explained gently beyond, uh, that beyond some grenades, which don't often work in the living land anyway, 
you may not have any explosives or heavy weapons. Current events. Now, here's what your character knows. In Eastern Living Land, as, as it's referred to by the Council, many groups of people who did not transform into something else when the bridges dropped and the storms hit three months ago have decided to remain in the area. Some folks were too stubborn to leave their homes and all they had worked for before the war, while others are truly trapped, whether by geography or violent opposition from the lizard population in the, in the area. Some simply cannot leave, so they persist as best they can. Regardless of their individual reasons for remaining, their cries for help have not gone unheard in the government, now based in Houston, uh, which is now based in Houston, uh, and as answered by using the Delphi Council, which you are a member of by proxy, if not desire or choice, to move arms, ammunition, food, clean water, and sundries into those areas. The Council a U.S. government-appointed think tank set up to discover how these invaders from other realities are able to do what they do and figure out how to combat them have had many groups, including yours, traveling into and through the area to find answers to the Council's questions. These runs present a perfect opportunity to speak with the population to debrief them about what they've seen, felt, or heard since supplies were last dropped with them, and to evaluate the health and well-being of the people and their communities, to keep a record of how they are faring in general under the axioms of the new reality. Although these sources of intelligence have proven useful to the Delphi Council toward battling the reality raiders, they have proven markedly less useful when it comes to finding out why the possibility energy of the Earth has been dampened so dramatically and why storm nights are reverting to their pre-war selves and, in many cases, dying from the shock of it. The receding energy levels, if a cause is not found and stopped, will bring a catastrophic end. The Near Now after being dropped off just outside Williamsburg, Kentucky, you make your way toward the area named by Dr. Merlin as the site of the exchange. Your thoughts turn to the briefing and, especially, the video of the storm nights dying, a chill chasing down your spine despite the excessive heat, using this to steal your resolve to follow the clues to whatever end they may lead you. Pulling this over in your mind as you continue your walk, you wipe the perspiration from your forehead and the back of your neck. Take another drink from your canteen and try to push thoughts of the outrageous heat from your mind. However, even as you recover, an unfamiliar fatigue comes over you. So, I need all of you to start out with a just a regular uh, D20, please. Most games begin with a survival test or the beginning of a combat. Get right into the action, right? Ours was no different, though in this case the loss was a possibility, drained by an as yet unseen engine designed to drain that energy. All three of you, Mo, Chris, and Peaches, you each of you loses one possibility as you feel a little bit sick. You feel somewhat ill. Yep. As normal, our technical difficulties, prevalent with any virtual tabletop, and well, frankly, most online role playing got the best of us for several minutes. But once we got them under control, it was easy to kind of re-engage with the game, uh, where stealth checks were made and failed, and then the players wound up being in trouble. As you're skulking through the jungle, you hear what sounds like a set of footsteps stopping. And they wound up facing off with a pair of Gotax for Edinos Warriors two Edino Scouts, and a set of four Gossbog. Though they had surprise so that each of them got to play a uh, card from their hand into their pool at the beginning of the first round of combat. But then Ginger decided to trade her Martyr card, having just seen it, for a possibility in a new Destiny card. But then, when I went to draw our first drama card, it was Reality Burst. And we all know what happened with the first reality burst that we did in the Day One Living Land adventure. If you don't remember that, go back and take a, a listen. It was something. Oh, some things really fell apart there. Okay, so reality burst. Oh no, we did this one before. On the first round of combat, Chris decided to use pyrokinesis behind the Adenos, with some minor protest from Mo, the Wonder Adenos, and Peaches wondering if they were actually just attacking, though she did note Gotax were just so well known for their negotiation techniques. 
noting also Sakal's general means of handling negotiations as well. Attack first and ask questions later. Well, the order that they decided on was that Mo would go first because he wanted to bless um, uh, everyone and uh, he did a success with it uh, for six rounds with spirit plus one and that was good then Chris went and he rolled well enough to at Peach's new suggestion burn the priest's robes well the priest's robes were pretty much leather and uh, relatively non-burning cloths then finally Peaches decided to go with her shotgun and um, hit one of the warriors and that's where we were for round one on this particular evening we had a storm of action totals that came out to be 15 I, I don't know why but it was like five or six or seven action totals that wound up being 15 which was good for all of us all around but uh, it, it kind of made for some interesting statistics all right, with Peach's shotgun hit and the minimum damage being taken, Ginger commented the bad guy was on his way to passing out any hour now. To which Josh, soon to be playing through ban, answered, Yeah, that's called sleep. Toward the end of the round, per the reality burst card, everyone rolled their reality, for which all succeeded, keeping their possibility energy. And then all of the villains were stymied. Uh, by the reality burst card and it turns out that uh, uh, they would do no small amount of damage to our heroes who for some reason from this point forward would have a nasty evening of combat play. The Gotak Vecton managed to invoke the miracle Grasping Vines, catching all the characters and making them stymied until they could break free or burn themselves away with Chris's pyrokinesis. Between rounds, as something of a joke for something that happened in our first adventure together, Ginger played a romance card, which really had no place on the table, but made for some fun. In the meantime, I rolled very high. And of course I have to choose a target, which... Oh my! Oh no! For one of the Adenos warriors to run Chris through with the rock shoot spear, though two bonus dice rolled too low to cause him much more damage. Another warrior attempting to run Mo through with a rock shoot spear missed, while a pair of Gosbog approached the group, causing them to roll fear. Chris, being the only one to fail, becoming very stymied as the Gotak Sarthus came through the jungle undergrowth, speaking under his hissing tongue to invoke curse against Chris for three rounds. Each of the Gotaks then rolled for reality, and both lost a possibility. This ended the first round of combat. The next drama card comes out. It is a distant roar. Let me kind of scale this one down a bit. The heroes must make a hard fear test or become stymied. Complaints erupted from all players as the cascade of bad drama card effects began in earnest for the night. Those not already very stymied had to roll for willpower or spirit, as Chris was already very stymied. He didn't have to worry about it. Ginger joined Chris in that stupor, however. Then the villains went first. Sarthus the Gotak attacked Chris with his spear and rolled a mishap on his two hit, becoming very stymied as he lost his balance amidst his own vines. Vecton moved next, rapidly covering the distance to Peaches, and used his spear, hitting with an action total of 14 against her melee defense of 11, and doing a whole two points of shock. Another warrior charged to Vecton's aid, scratching Peaches again. A third came to Penny to harm her as she seemed to be skinning by each of his compatriots, becoming involved in the slow dance to bleed her out through a thousand paper cuts. With a single shock point remaining... The attack ceased on Peaches, as no others could approach her to attack and damage her. Apart from Chris taking a single point of shock from moving out of the way of another uh, uh, attack from a Gosbog, uh, all further bad guys unable to come near them due to their compatriots being in the way, the round turned over to the good guys. 
Uh, I had forgotten to tell you that defend and trick are your approved actions. And you guys get to act next, but you get a setback. While Ginger was AFK, I asked Andrew and Chris to try developing things that might make things better for them, and they joked about thinking of things for their setback that would not make it worse for them, and they couldn't think of a thing. They then took the reverse course and started talking about T-Rexes and Z-Rexes and introducing a field full of Gosbog. Now, I'm normally not a cruel GM, but I can't say I didn't think about those things that evening. Let's put it this way. All of you are captured. You are surrounded by all of these bad guys, and you are captured. Um, the uh, Well, you're, you're going to like how I do this so that we can kind of move on with the adventure. I didn't expect you guys to suck this bad. Many whines and complaints of unfairness came uh, forward on my announcement of their capture. Despite agreements, they usually stomped mud holes in my opposition. Upon moving out, soon they began hearing gunfire in the jungle, and the Adenos who captured them began to move in that direction. All right, so you hear the sounds of battle and see, despite the thick jungle all around you, a massive 30-foot-long screw-shaped nose poking into the sky from the ground below. The knights, being left behind by their captors for the sake of allowing them to join the bloodletting in the clearing with Hare, Dr. Marlin's incredible digging device, left our characters to their own devices. Our heroes, on being abandoned by their Adenos captors, gained their first ever glimpse of a Nile Empire shock trooper, just as he was being tackled by some Gosbok. He fired back with his Schmeiser MP40 and destroyed one of the mindless beasts, and then from this point, the game took on a more or less tactical combat simulation as I worked to rid the battlefield of too many bad guys on three sides of the combat. While Peaches and Chris were looking at the main battle, Mo caught out of the corner of his eye a skinny Adinos holding something that was shiny and gold. Hmm. When the scout noticed Mo looking at him, he decided to take off, and Mo went right after him. At this, we moved into rounds, the first drama card being hot and humid. Though the players had already been complaining about the amount of shock they were taking, this card just added to that, because if you're wearing armor of any kind, it adds two points of shock to you. And of course, this was not their night to have good cards, especially since the villains were about to go first. Watching as the Nile military people ran to the top of the digging device and Gosbog following them, our characters then acted. Mo continued chasing the tiny Adinos and attempted to take him down. Andrew commented about how bad he was at everything, getting an answer from Ginger that he was great at destroying tables and the like, so he could tackle the guy and finish the job. However, the little guy almost escaped, forcing Andrew to use a possibility. In the end, Mo grappled his foe, allowing the wonder a Fabergé egg to pop loose and fly deeper into the jungle. This began to seem like a bad rendition of Romancing the Stone, except for the 160 meter long by 80 meter high Boraka standing there as its left foot stomped down to crush them both to death. But would this be the end of Mo, the Wonder Adinos? Even as Mo passed from this world, dying under a monstrously massive foot, Professor Anwar Sharif began firing his ray gun. Peaches, you've been through fires where you've heard electrical um, uh, sparking, right? Yeah. And then Chris, you're an aerospace engineer, so you've probably seen or heard failures that resulted in electrical sparking, right? Okay. Off to your left which would be right on the screen, you hear a bunch of this electrical sparking and a wave of... a wave of reality rolls over you. It, it feels like, and, and Thuban, this is for you too, um, a, a wave rolls over you and it feels like your moment of crisis where you had to make a decision to become a squishy or become a storm knight. Peaches, on her turn, decides to attack Vecton, blindsiding the Godak, Gotak, 
running up to him and shooting him with a Remington. I was able to show Ginger how to use the measuring tool to move through the jungle on our battle map properly, instead of just moving straight through, um, which would have been impractical. Uh, and then, uh, when she shot him, the Gotag took a wound, recoiling from the damage, but was able to recover readily enough, with a new card in place, louder than words. Approved actions being attack and intimidate, the heroes finally caught a break, going first, beginning the new round. Ginger decides Peaches was going to shoot Vecton again, this time swearing like a Manhattan firefighter, something to make sailors blush, forcing Vecton to spend a possibility to soak. To add insult to injury, Peaches was going to attempt to negate, though we found out she couldn't negate a soak. Vecton still suffered another wound. Some of the best roleplay swearing happened this night. It's too bad I didn't get it on audio. Chris decided to use Pyrokinesis again on Vecton, gained a bonus die, and wound up forcing the Gotak to defeat. Vecton failed his defeat roll, as tough a customer as he had been, and finally gave his life force back to Lenala. As Ginger made fun of my wonderful killing laugh, yeah. <laughs> I prepared for using a shock trooper to spray and pray against both active characters, but I wound up failing with him. He disconnected and wound up expiring. Crackles of red lightning accentuating blue dust flying through the air. Another two shock troopers came around the corner to back up their fellow soldier. In the confusion of the combat winding down, Peaches turned to Chris to ask him where Mo was, the latter responding in a high-pitched squeal that he didn't have a clue. As Peaches and Chris approached the digging device, the Nile troopers began shooting at them. The Nile officer uh, and his men fired first, handing Peaches a little bit of shock, uh, but his subordinates all wound up missing. Nile folks began disappearing into the digging device at this point. Then it was time for the Gosbog to rush the Nile troops on the digging device, attacking first the officer who was trying to protect his men. He fended off the Gosbog well, but another undead shambler got by to attack one of his other men anyway. Meanwhile, Adino scouts not yet seeing Chris and Peaches fired their bows at the Nile troopers. The new drama card flipped was Spirit Mist Arises. Darkness caused a penalty to all attacks, except for Adinos with the Star Eyes perk. On this round, a reality surge swept through the space. The remaining Nile troops, not caught by other opponents, finished dropping into the digging device. The shock troops on the ground, attempting to press their attack against Peaches, missed. Next, the Adino scouts on the ground shot and killed the Nile Empire officer who was protecting his men. Sarthus then waylaid one of the shock troopers by flinging his rock shoot spear and running him through to his death. The surge rolled through and Chris disconnected, becoming more savage until he could apply his bonus as a realm runner, recovering immediately from the disconnect. Then, the surge passed. It was their turn to act. Ginger wondered again where Mo had gone off to, but she decided to let that wait and... Uh, moved up to attack both of the shock troops remaining on the ground, killing both with her shotgun blast. Chris decided to move up near Peaches and project pyrokinesis on the other Gotak, Sarthus. Due to the prominence of miracles in our group, I took leave of my senses and was looking for pyrokinesis in miracles instead of in psionics. However, I got quickly back on the right course, reference-wise, and we moved forward. Chris threw down a coup de grace, to add more damage to wound the Adinos Gotak, uh, who decided not to soak. Pulling the new drama card, Lanala's Rage was revealed, forcing all characters to become stymied. Among the complaints about being stymied, Ginger decided to joke about being put out, explaining, All right, I'll stymie myself, to which all of us had a great laugh. The villains went first again, the Adenos warriors and Sarthus moving up to attack Peaches. Chris was already busy with a pair of warriors, so they couldn't get up to attack him. Meanwhile, the scouts moved up the digging device to push the presently immobile Gosbog into it. Why were they immobile? Because they didn't know how to follow the Nile shock troopers. The scouts then decided to shoot at Peaches, both of them missing. Then Sarthus invoked Curse against Chris getting an outstanding success, making him very stymied. Unfortunately, very stymied is as high as you can go, otherwise Chris might be at a minus 7 instead of a minus 4. Warriors 3 and 4 decided it was, despite missing, 
impale Chris Day. The heroes then surged, neither of which disconnected. Ginger decided to move and shoot at the, the Adenos warrior, whom had attempted to kill her most recently, but Chris interfered with pyrokinesis. With Ginger's support again gaining a bonus die for him, this was enough to put the Adenos warrior down. Soothe Savage Beast was pulled next, with any action taken in the round being worthy to gain a card. As well, the heroes were to be inspired. Finally, a round going in the player's favor. This had been a tough night for them, and I hoped we would finish well. Their numbers dwindled. Sarthus uh, called for his Adenos to leave the battlefield. Ginger and Chris attempted to turn their attention toward finding Mo, but rather heard screaming from inside the incredible digging device and shooting. Peaches, free from danger, decided to climb inside and continue her journey toward it. Beyond here, find the description of what they saw as they approached the machine. As you're moving up to the machine, you hear a bunch of high-pitched noises going off, but also machine gun fire. Okay? Um, and then the, uh, the machine gun fire ceases, and you no longer hear uh, anything for a little while. Now, getting up on the machine, well, I'm going to kind of move both of you up on, you know, kind of on the machine. Uh, it, you don't have to be in this particular order. You find a crate full of rifles, okay? Uh, a busted crate full of rifles laying on the ground. They look like M1 Garands. Um, you see a door uh, that has block and tackle, and there are a couple of cargo doors. And as you're kind of looking over the, the hump, if you will, the middle of the digging machine, you see a scientist, kind of looks like Doc Brown, Back to the Future, crazy hair and everything, um, and you might be able to recognize him as a scientist and could probably guess it's Dr. Marlin. Uh, he has a massive rock shoot spear through his chest, and he's laying there bleeding out. Chris and Peaches, yes. you get up on top of the digging device, um, and you see a pair of cargo doors that um, swing wide, but they run parallel to the length of, of the carriage that you're standing on, the trolley that you're standing on. Down inside, you see a couple of things. You see... A, a two meter wide green, I guess it's green, right? Thuban is green? Sure. Okay. Um, uh, star shaped creature with a mouth with very sharp teeth on top, but it has something on its back that's got cogs and, and, um, uh, like a battery pack. You can see, you can see that there's a red and blue, uh, crystal that seems to be powering this, and there's a little arc of lightning that, that goes across it every so often. Um, and this creature can't seem to move very well. This is when they encountered Thuban for the first time, as he called out to them for help. Unfortunately, to get to him, they were going to have to finish a Gosbog off first. Um, but it's kind of really weak. It's hard to hear uh, this giant starfish, if you will. Um, but about a meter away from it, at the bottom of the ladder, just getting to the bottom of the ladder, is one of the two Gosbog. In a room that has all kinds of crates, um, shapes and sizes of crates, um, and it's got several barrels inside and, and everything like that. The room itself is only about seven meters long and three meters wide. Maybe it's four meters wide. I'd have to look again. Um, but, uh, uh, yeah, let's see. So one, two, yeah, it's three meters wide and one, two, three, four, five, six and a half meters long. Okay. Uh, and you see a whole, you know, just metal walls that look like they, they have, they've had water running down them, some condensation. They've got some rust going on. They're not painted very well. And it's very similar on the floor. Okay. But, uh, 
when you're when you're looking down in there, you also see one of the shock troopers, but only one of the shock troopers, who is, um, uh, who is starting to fire. In fact, he does fire at uh, Gosbog three. So let me let me kind of take care of that real quick, uh, since it's I believe it's villains, right? Or have I do I have to draw another card yet? Yeah, I would have to draw another card. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to draw this card here. Losing blood. Any heroes with one or more wounds suffer an additional wound? Fortunately, none of the knights was already harboring a wound. On top of the possibility of taking a wound, however, they would suffer a setback, adding insult to injury. The PCs unable as yet to drop into the digging machine, I did not switch maps for them. The shock trooper sharing the cargo hold with the Goss Bog panic fired at the Goss Bog and missed. The Goss Bog then chased after the fleeing shock trooper. And after a lengthy scene transition, we continued play. Peaches decided to descend into the machine first, followed immediately by Chris. On turning around from climbing down the ladder, Peaches found a Stallinger, typically native of the Living Land, though this one had been captured as it emerged from one of the Living Land's wonders. Now, from the Ruins of the Living Land book, uh, page 5, Stallingers. Only a handful of Stallingers survived Barwick Kaw's original conquest. Stallingers are strange beings, even by the Living Land standards. They have five symmetrical arms radiating out from a central body. The body has a toothy mouth capable of vocalization, but the Stallingers' native language is based on touch from their supple appendages. The most impressive natural feature of Stallingers is their lift bladders, each process lighter than air gases that enable the entire creature to float. All the gas is released when the creature sleeps or is knocked out, so Stallingers instinctively shun heights in case something goes wrong. What you see is on its back, it has um, a, a medium-sized backpack with a bunch of stuff on one of its legs or, or limbs. It's got a short sword attached to another one of its limbs. And then there are some, some extra things going on uh, all over it. But in the middle of its back, nearest its teeth, <laughs> um, is some kind of a box. It has blue, blue and red arcing going across it. It has several wires coming out from it. It has gears and cogs that are working together. Um, some of the gears are spinning very rapidly. Some of them act like clock pieces and move very slowly. Um, and other than that, you can't tell what's going on. Now, Chris, on the other hand, uh, if I'm not mistaken, you're an engineer. Yeah. Okay. So you could roll. Let's see. What would be best? Roll evidence analysis. Chris wanted to use a card not already in his pool, but as they were technically in a combat, he actually couldn't to help figure out the attachment on Taban's back. A Gosbog that had dropped in before the PCs turned to attack Peaches and missed. Peaches then turned to face her attacker and, with the Remington, hit well with two bonus dice, killing it with a pair of wounds. Chris then rolled evidence analysis to help with his engineering to aid Thuban in getting free and failed. I then asked Josh to describe his character Thuban to everyone so Chris might gain an idea as to how to help him. The basic description was that of an advanced fantasy genre character, but rearranged as a five-armed giant green starfish with a big toothy mouth on top of its body and several magic items all around. Strong Spirits was pulled to the table then, the heroes continuing their sudden streak of luck, apart from the villains being inspired. Then, Peach is engaged already, Chris decided to play an idea card, and this is what he saw. Okay, you see the box, the arcing box, and you see that there's actually just a very simple button on it. Now, this is something that Thuban was not able to see because of the way the box is pointed. Also, I have no eyes. Yeah, yeah technically you have no eyes, so you have to kind of sense everything. 
pressing the button, Chris helped release his new friend from the slavery imposed by the weird science device on his back. Thuban, his limbs released, began regenerating his energy and would be able to act on the coming round. The villains, not able to make use of the inspiration, uh, had Ginger teasing, Neener, neener, neener. Again, the shock troopers and goss bogs from the living land continued attempting to kill one another with limited success due to bad dice. Around this point in the evening, technical difficulties began to become insane, raising my ire to a new height for me with regards to roll 20. Something about you was the name of the new card, allowing anyone with charisma higher than 8 to treat all rolls as favored. The villains were allowed to go first this round, but were stymied. One of the remaining Living Land Gossbog rolled a 1 inside a Nile hardpoint and deanimated. Another shock trooper backed up after being attacked by the Gossbog and wound up face to face sidelong with Peaches. Thuban, in this new round, attempted and failed to cast Hellfire, taking shock for the failure, still not quite strong enough to take such a bold and dangerous action. Chris then went to invoke pyrokinesis on the same guy and rolled a four-case contradiction, disconnecting and suffering shock. And the comedy of errors continued. Peach is then, at point-blank range, used her Remington 870 against the same guy. But wait a minute. Someone, I think it was actually Chris, remembered that tests were favored for high charisma folks for the round. So, going back to Chris's pyrokinesis role, where he actually succeeded this time, uh, he, he rolled for, uh, he gained two bonus dice for his damage roll, and the shock trooper was immolated with a damage roll of 20, and obtained out of that 5 wounds and 10 shock. Due to the amazing bonus die roll, Chris gained a possibility. Taking a vote on whether to continue on or kill it for the evening, my friends decided to go on for a little while longer. At this, Thuban and the others introduced themselves. Peaches put him on the hot seat to explain the sort of creature he was, and all introduced themselves further. Then, the first thing Thuban managed to do was to create a zombie raising a recently slain shock troop from the dead. Peaches and Chris, while you're kind of there, you see you, you see Thuban's you know, limbs and stuff start to kind of flail about a little bit, and its mouth is, is uttering, you know, it, it appears to be uttering words, even though the sounds are more like vibrations in the air from its body. Instead, That's so weird. it is very, very weird. This thing is undulating at about a billion miles a second. Um, and the zombie that, uh, or the, the shock trooper, which has almost all of its flesh still. Oh, no, wait a minute. It was burned pretty well, but it, it's got enough flesh to become a zombie. Um, it starts to stand up again. The, uh, the, Schmeiser MP40 drops to the ground, and the short sword stays in its, in its scabbard, even though the short sword is almost burned to a crisp, okay? And then the zombie just kind of kind of stands there naked. It's got no headdress or clothing or anything because it's all been burned off. Um, it just kind of stands there and uh, moves back and forth, kind of almost with the rhythm of Thuban's... Um, uh, limbs. Uh, you also notice something else strange about the Stallinger, who is Taban. Uh, who is Taban? Um, he has a medium shield, uh, like an actual fighter's shield that kind of floats around him about a half a meter away. Okay. The the, the, the starfish, basically. <laughs> He, yes, he is floating about uh, uh, about a meter and a half off the ground, and this shield is almost like it's dancing around him. Yeah, that wouldn't freak anyone out, now would it? With an outstanding success, the zombie he raised was actually deadlier, tougher, and uglier. 
than a normal one. Zombie by Thuban. It could be a fashion statement. Layers in Roll20, as it turns out, are not friends of mine. I was having a very difficult time getting between the layers uh, on Roll20. However, we drove on, and Peaches, being staunchly Catholic, crossed herself and expressed, Madre de Dios. Thuban then ordered the zombie to take point, it doing so with a <clears throat> of acknowledgement as a scout. As our heroes all moved to inspect within the carriage. From your end of the carriage, um, you hear what sounds like a large motor begin to whir. Um, and then uh, you hear what sounds like rocks being laundered, if you will. Apart from the engine noises being discussed, we had uh, a discussion about our missing Mo. Not quite certain what to think of that, but I made it a point to uh, put it into the next session that we would go ahead and go for the next session. Then others began commenting about uh, uh, keeping an eye out for Sakal in the next game session, and that he would come wandering in like, oh hey guys, what did I miss? And, and then they would have to fill him in and stuff like that. And I kind of ran over territory for that, saying that yes, Sakal would have to um, uh, be updated, but at the same time, he would not... Um, um, you know, he was probably facing bigger, nastier stuff as we were as we were going along in the game. Um, so this concluded the evening of play, um, and we all agreed that uh, the next time, uh, th you know, that everybody had fun, and that the next time several things would get accomplished. Um, but uh, beyond the game, a small note about the uh, which is. Right now, it's the 26th of March of 2021, and the note that I have for you is that the recordings of July 25th, for the evening of July 25th, actually came out to be okay. Nothing's going to be perfect, especially when it's my second attempt, but the recordings are good. Now, the August 1st recordings, we go back to where I have to update, uh, or, or I have to make a... Uh, a highlight video of it but after that I have been watching and watching and watching to make sure that my settings were correct and that everything was cool so I'm going to call it an evening with you all and I hope that uh, you will tune in for the next thrilling episode of Possibility War